We have members participating in person, our offices in Fresno, Bakersfield, and Modesto. We will do our best to facilitate a smooth meeting with public participation via Zoom and webcast. Before we begin, uh, here are some important guidelines and general instructions. Uh, the first one to ask everybody to uh, silence your cell phones or other communication devices you might have to avoid the disruption of the meeting. Uh, we are asking that all public participants, uh, we will remind public participants they will be muted until uh, unmuted by the host if they want to make any public comments when those are requested. Uh, also, after each agenda item, uh, I will make an announcement when those public comments are, are open so that uh, if someone needs to or would like to make a comment, just raise your hand so that the clerk could uh, recognize your intent to participate and unmute you. So with that, um, I'm calling this meeting to order being 535, and I'm asking if we can have the roll call, please. Yes. Okay. Nayamin Martinez. Present. Keith Freitas. Laura Gutil. Present. Dennis Brazil. Here. Esperanza Vilma. Here. Thomas Helm. Derek Williams. Rashima Dean. Richard O'Brien. Here. Thank you. Orchel Cryer. Ned Leba. I'm here. Manuel Cunha. Chris McLaughlin. Um, through the chair, we do not have a quorum. Thank you. So based on that, uh Sorry, take that back. Through the chair, we do have a quorum. Okay, who just joined? Okay. Well, thank you. Um, so uh, we're gonna move us to the next agenda item. So approval of our, the minutes from our February 2023 meeting. Uh, those have been provided in the packet. So please take a minute to review them. And when you are ready, uh, we can proceed with a motion. I move to approve the, the minutes. Okay, a second. I second, this is SB. Thank you, SB. Um, so I think we just can go like that, right? We don't have to take a vote. Okay, so uh, mi minutes are approved. And now uh, can we hear if there's any public comments? Do we have any public comments in Bakersfield? No public comments in Bakersfield. Thank you. Do we have any public comments in Modesto? No public comments in Modesto. Are there any members of the public in Fresno that would like to comment? None in office and none indicated online. Thank you. Well, I'll keep my comments uh, brief. I just want to take this opportunity to um, thank Jessica and to welcome welcome her on behalf of the EJAC to this new role. She will be leading these meetings moving forward. Uh, we definitely thank Morgan for his time doing this and uh, we look forward to working with you, Jessica. Thank you for all that uh, you have done in the past and I'm sure you will continue doing with all of us. Thank you, I look forward to working with you all. Thanks, Amy. Thank you. Okay, so a very important item. Um, election of vice chair for one year term. We uh, postponed that uh, last time and we have uh, another member just joining the Modesto office. So please reflect that Mr. Helm just joined. Through the chair, let the record show that Mr. Thomas Helm has joined the meeting. Okay, so uh, welcome Tom. Uh, we are just starting the process of discussing uh, who wants to nominate some of our members to serve as vice chairs. Uh, so I'm open it up to proposals uh, or, or nominations.
can everybody speak at once? Yes, one at a time, please. Um, <laughs> so just as a reminder, uh, Tom Helms have served in that capacity in the previous year. So I would like, uh, if I don't hear anybody else, I would like to make a motion, oh, well, to, to uh, make a, a nomination, to nominate uh, Tom Helm to serve another year, obviously if he uh, accepts the nomination. Um, I accept, sorry for being late. And I know that I, I missed the last couple meetings. That was bad timing with the, the two months there, um, but I, I plan on regularly attending again. So I, I will gladly accept, thank you. Okay, any other nominations? Okay, I guess it's gonna be one nomination and can we do a roll call please? Do we need to do or no? Oh, sorry. no yeah, no second yes. is needed. It is not a motion. It's just open nominations, and then you can take a roll call vote or voice, okay. voice vote if you'd like. Okay. okay. Nayamin Martinez? Yes. Ke uh, Laura Gutiel? Yes. Dennis Brazil? Aye. Esperanza Vielma? Yes. Thomas Helm? Aye. Uh, can I vote or do I have saying yes? <laughs> Richard O'Brien? Yes. Ned Leba? Yes. Through the chair motion passes. Thank you and uh, congratulations to our recently re-elected vice chair. Um, thank you, Tom, for uh, accepting this nomination. We will move on to the update on attainment plans and rules. Perfect. Thank you. And uh, good evening, Madam Chair and Committee. My name is Emily Neeland. And I'm the Program Manager of our Air Quality Planning Team here at the District, and I'm here today to provide you with an update on our plan and rule development projects. So first for our projects for planning, we are currently working to develop a revised attainment plan for the 2012 PM 2.5 standard. And we did hold our first workshop on March 23rd to discuss, present, and receive feedback on the development of the plan. And we have also scheduled a second public workshop for May 11th at 3 p.m. We're also continuing to work on our contingency measure state implementation plan revision. And that will also include amendments uh, proposed to rule 4901, which is our wood burning fireplaces and wood burning heaters rule. We did hold two public workshops already, one in March and one in April, and we are taking the package to the governing board for consideration here at the upcoming May governing board public hearing. We're also working on our one hour ozone maintenance plan. We had a workshop, we've been very busy with workshops recently. We held one in, on April 18th and tentatively taking that to our governing board this summer. And for our rule projects, the governing board recently adopted at the April meeting our rule amendments to rules 1020 definitions 2201, which is our rule for new and modified stationary source review, and 2301, which is our rule for emission reduction credit banking. And again, those were adopted at the April governing board hearing. So you will now be submitting those to EPA for inclusion in the state implementation plan. We're also continuing to work on our rule development project for leak detection and repair for the oil and gas industry. And we've held a number of workshops with the most recent one held on April 17th to discuss, present, and receive feedback on the draft rules that we published ahead of the workshop. And we are continuing to finalize our amendments and plan to bring our proposed uh, rule amendments to our governing board here in the next few months. And then lastly, we're continuing to work on our rule development projects for Rule 4402, crude oil production sumps, and we're also continuing to work on Rule 4550, which is our rule for conservation management practices. And with that, that concludes my updates. And I would be happy to take any questions or comments that you guys may have. Thank you. Any questions or comments? I have a couple, but I want to rush. Um, I do. Go ahead. Um, OK, thank you. So um, I just have a question on the crude oil um, production and um, and also so the rule 4401 4402 do you um, know if anything as far as like funding sources from the um, dismantling of the offshore oil rigs if that's going to have any effect on like 
funding, you know, coming this way, perhaps, you know, due to the fact that they're going to decommission like all of the all the oil rigs in, in California? Yeah, thank you for that question. At this point, I haven't heard anything related to the funding of how that may impact the rural development or any funding that the district may be um, receiving for those those rural development projects. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, um, I have two questions. I'll follow up on the oil thing. So all of these rules that you're considering here uh, related to uh, crude oil production or, or associated to any oil production, um, I, I was uh, aware that many of these rules have exemptions for small producers. Um, so my question is, is that going to continue to be the case or are you considering expanding the rules to include also small producers? Yeah, at this point, we are not proposing any revisions to those exemptions. The rule, the rule amendments that we're currently working on developing are specifically related to our RAC deficiencies for reasonably available control technologies, as well as BART best available retrofit control technologies. But at this time, we're not going to be removing those exemptions. Why? I mean, I understand that the fit is to, to focus on large operations and BART and all that, but I would say that you know it should also include um, small producers. Yeah, I appreciate those comments, and we did receive some similar some questions related to that at the most recent workshop, so we'll definitely take that into consideration. But at this point, with the draft rules that we've published, we have not proposed to remove those those uh, exemptions, but I really appreciate your comments on that, and I'll definitely be be passing that forward. Yeah, I just want to say that uh, through the work that um, some of the, organ the members of the organization that I, are, I lead, uh, that they have done, a lot of the violations that we have encountered for all operators had concentrated on small producers. So to me and to many community members who live near these producers, it's very problematic that a violation is encountered um, and no, they, they cannot be an enforcement because that, that exemption exists. So just want to make that comment. The second question, uh, I understand you have been busy with public workshops, but I think in the past I have mentioned the importance of making the workshops or scheduling the workshops uh, at a time where we allow for more participation. And I know three is later than two, but I still think it's too early during the day because a lot of community members that might want to participate are not gonna be able because they will have to make, you know, take a day, hours out of, their work and, and it's not possible for everybody. Yeah, I appreciate that comment. And based on your comment at the last EJAG meeting that I attended, we did hold the workshop for both the contingency package as well as the PM plan, I believe around 4 or 5 p.m. Um, and we did hold those until about 7 p.m. So we did definitely take that into consideration and we always do our best to schedule them as late as possible. But I really appreciate that comment again. Okay, thank you. So those are my comments and questions. Anybody else has an additional question or comment? Through the chair, I, I do. Um, I'm not sure where it was, but you did mention something about the zero emission vehicles, right? No, I did not. You did, oh, okay. I, I thought you mentioned a workshop about that. I was going to ask, then that, never mind. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have any public comments? Are there any public comments in Bakersfield? No public comments in Bakersfield. Thank you. Are there any public comments in Modesto? No public comments in Modesto. Thank you. Are there any members of the public in Fresno office that would like to comment? I see no. Okay, I see none, and there are no indication of any comments online. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you for your report. Okay. I know some some people are here very nervous, but it's their time to come to the podium. Our next item is a presentation by students from the Center for Advanced Research and Technology, CARD for short. Uh, so we will hear from two sets of students that attend this uh, institution, either in the morning or the evening or afternoon session. And they will be presenting on an awesome project that they conducted since February of this year. So um, full disclosure, I have been their mentor. So um, just wanted to.
reflect that. But anyhow, so please, uh, students, come to the podium. The the first uh, the AM team will start with you. Yeah. We switch. Yeah. Sorry. Hello. Oh. Hello. We are the CART Environmental Justice Team, and today we will be presenting you, to you our visualization of Ozone Project. I'm Rihanna. I'm Yesenia. And I'm Santiago. And unfortunately, two of our team members, Kyla and Avery, were not able to make it here today. As I mentioned before, we are students from CART, which stands for the Center for Advanced Research and Technology. And it is basically a separate high school campus that allows both students from Clovis Unified and Fresno Unified school districts to attend what we call labs at CART. Um, labs are, they are basically classes that are career-based. For example, there is an engineering lab where students learn about different types of engineering. They can also 3D print. Uh, there's a business lab where students learn about stocks, how to create a business, uh, what are the responsibilities of a business owner. And there are many other different labs offered at CART. Uh, for us personally, we are part of the environmental science lab. Um, and kind of how it works at CART, um, students from each lab are required to do a semester project. Uh, which is what we are presenting to you today uh, about environmental justice regarding air quality. So what is environmental justice? Environmental justice is the fair treatment of everyone, regardless of race, income, et cetera, um, regarding uh, the development and enforcement of environmental laws. It is also the fight against environmental racism, um, which is where people of color are more impacted by harmful environmental factors. An example of this is Malaga Elementary. Um, if you go by and drive around over there, there's actually an Amazon warehouse placed right next to the elementary school. So when kids go out and play at recess, they're actually breathing in that smoke that's being emitted by the warehouse. In our project, we... Um... In our project, we are introduced to ozone, which is a high reactive gas that is composed of oxygen atoms, and it, it, it can be both created naturally and man-made. Um, ozone is formed by NOx, which is ammunition and industrial process, and VOX, which is conducted from dairy and UV radiation, which is caused by sunlight. Particulate matter 2.5 is a pollutant that... Um, um, sorry, um, particularly matter 2.5 is a pollutant that causes um, health impacts, both indoor and outdoor. Indoor air pollution is caused by smog, tobacco smoke, and any other usage of household products, while outdoor air pollution is caused by ammunition, combustion, fossil fuels, and agriculture. So giving a bit of statistics, according to the State of the Air 2022, uh, Fresno is ranked first out of 25 cities most polluted by daily PM, Bakersfield falling in second, and Fairbanks being third. Our research question specifically focuses on the air pollution in the Central Valley and issues regarding the communities experiencing worse pollution than others, um, specifically um, people of color um, experiencing pollution in or from industrial um, building placements, environmental justice would help bring awareness to those being affected by and giving them a, giving them a voice. This question also adds that um, this this question provides us with what we know and what we don't know about yet. So due to that, we would have to conduct further research. The sources that we used to collect data was Cal Virus Screen, Google Maps, and 2020 Census. Cal Virus Screen was able to locate and identify um, the community's specific pollution in that area. Google Maps was um, able to help us um, locate the air monitor and industrial development. 
and 2020 census was able to um, give us specific um, information such as residents, demographics, economic, social, and household characteristics. So we were given a list of 10 communities and using the sources mentioned in the previous slide, we, were, we had to collect data about different parameters. Here are the list of param some of the parameters we decided to focus on. Uh, one of them is being proximity to the nearest air monitor. An additional source we also used was AirNow. So it shows um, the already pl placed air monitors, so the colored dots, and the one that's marked blue is one of our communities that we were researching. So you can kind of see that uh, gap between the two. Um, the process of choosing a community, we picked our top three and um, graded them out of 100 points. And in the end, Raisin City scored the highest, meaning that the proximity to an air monitor and proximity to um, overall pollution burden was heavily um, weighed. So based off our point system, we did uh, choose Raisin City. Uh, we had actually took a field trip on Tuesday, April 25th, to install the monitor and also conduct surveys with the locals. Speaking about setting the air monitor, we also uh, set up community surveying. So while a few of us were setting up the air monitor, the rest of us were surveying the people that were there to attend the setup of the air monitor. And some of the questions that did we ask the community, community members was if they know about all these resources being brought to them, like Cal Enviro Screen and Air Now. Something very interesting as well that we found out is that for them to receive air quality information, they would like it for there to be a mobile app or text message as well as flyers. Moving forward, so we were talking about assembling a, an air monitor and it is, it's called Moose. And a little background about the Moose monitor is that it originated in the University of Colorado. And although they were supposed to fly out to help us set up this monitor, they were unable to, but did they did, they did send us a very helpful video helping set a, um, setting it up. And it was a really good experience as well because we got to be very hands-on as well and responsible for this air monitor, monitor deployment. So I forgot to add on, but the Moose air monitor does, uh, does capture all the uh, pollutants and gives up, up, gives up to date information to the community. And now speaking about the monitor deployment. So initially we did want to set up this monitor in a school, but since we were uncertain about their response, we did decide to set it with a local community member in Raisin City. And her name is Susie. And uh, we did have a couple factors to consider, like if it would get destroyed or robbed, but we are hoping that it does bring a lot of helpful information for the community members of Raisin City. And we also did set up the rest of it, half of it, the air, uh, the solar panel as well. So in conclusion and our future goals and impact. So our future goals for this is to raise more awareness to community members, as well as the impact that we want to have on these community members is for them to be more aware. And another goal for us would be that future CART students take over this project and expand on it. Yeah, thank you. Are there any questions? We're, we're going to wait until the other group presents and take questions for the two groups, if you don't mind. Thank you, group. Um, so let's go to the PM students. And I just want to clarify, the monitor measures ozone and PM 2.5. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Charlie. We are part of environmental science. These are my partners, Jack and Katie, and we are here to talk about air pollution and education and monitoring. So air, poor air quality is a phenomenon impacting poor communities of color. There are many things that can cause poor air quality, but there are also many ways we can keep an eye on the air quality to try to improve it. Um, some of the causes of poor air quality can be factories, diesel trucks, and automobiles. 
in order to observe poor air quality firsthand, um, early in our project, we took a trip to South Fresno. In order to demonstrate that South Fresno actually does have very poor air quality, I pulled up some Cal Enviro screen scores. For those of you who may not know, Cal Enviro screen scores are percentile scores out of 100, where the higher the score, the more air pollution. So in 85, 96, and 99 are fairly bad scores. We observed some, a few different sources of possible pollution while we were there. Some were plants. There is a vitro glass plant and a feed plant near there. We also observed 723 semi-trucks and 100 warehouses, which do indicate fairly heavy industrial and shipping activity. Uh, as part of our project as well, we learned about ozone and PM 2.5 before we went out and did our research. We focused on health impacts and sources, as well as methods of measuring air quality and the groups most impacted by air pollution. So our method in choosing the community we selected is we were assigned three communities each. And out of the three communities that we had, we each had to choose one community that had the worst qualities coming from uh, poor air quality, low education, and language isolation. From there, we then scored each community with the information we gathered. So, and then some of the information that we had gathered was way more like proximity to regulatory monitor, levels of PM 2.5, and levels of ozone. Uh, the community selection results uh, gave us the information that we needed to select Linaire due to its high monitor score of 92 out of 100. Uh, most of the driving factors into choosing uh, our scores came from a distance from a regulatory monitor, a low medium income, and a high exposure to um, sources that contribute to ozone formation. Uh, the categories that they didn't score the most amount of points in were be, would be a percentage of, with bachelor degrees and a language isolation. We had decided to set up a MOOSE device in Linear to be able to detect both the ozone and 2.5 qualities there. And the, it provides three key parts of the MOOSE, which is first the radiation shield, which is on the left side of the screen, which provides the housing box, which is in the middle, a, a radiation shield that protects it from the sun's radiation as well as uh, being too hot, and as well as it is the one that absorbs all the pollutants that uh, the housing box will measure. And the solar panel is a very important part, as that means we can put it up in um, poor communities that don't have as much access to electricity as it will power itself. And a lot of problems that affect Linaire's air quality is um, waste management. The city doesn't provide well waste management for the property size there. And so people tend to have more trash than they can actually put in their trash bins per week, which uh, causes them to need to burn the trash, which creates very bad air quality to where people with asthma need to wear a mask outside just so they can keep their lungs clear of all the negative particles that would affect them. And we had chosen the community center for our monitor placement, particularly on the ceiling, so that we could uh, get a more clear and safe viewing of all of our uh, all of the data that it would gather, so that it could be higher up. While we were in Linaire, in order to deploy our monitor, we also surveyed in a community member who was experienced with fielding air quality and public issues. Linaire is a very small community, so we didn't feel the need to do a large scale survey like the AM team. What we learned about Linaire from the community member was that education of people from Linaire on the air monitor should be fairly continuously reoccurring as the community is small and new members arrive regularly. And to be able to get to the word to everyone, we should use a non-electronic source because older community members would have problems with it. Uh, in the end, we decided to make two different resources. One pamphlet that would visually lay out the information of where our monitor was, what it did, 
and how to access the information, and also a PowerPoint presentation on that would both auditorily enforce the information in our pamphlet and reveal more information about why ozone is so important and exactly what our monitor does do and how it works. We were unable to collect results on Linair's actual air quality from our monitor due to the timing of our placements, but we did expect to see fairly high ozone levels. The evidence that we have for this are, is a previous study which cited that rural areas that were fairly close to urban areas uh, had higher levels of air pollution. Linair fits that bill pretty well. It's a small rural community and it's fairly close to Riverdale, which has a fair amount of production activity. Additionally, the rubric that we scored the community on initially, we largely weighted factors that would indicate higher ozone levels than were previously being measured. So our rubric itself, the high score on that indicates that Linair probably does have high ozone levels. Thank you very much for listening to our presentation. Thank you, students. So um, now I'm gonna open it up for comments or questions. Um, obviously from our colleagues in the Modesto office, because I, I have uh, the students available to me to ask more questions, but any comments or questions? Um, well, I'll make a comment first, which is, you know, this is a very excellent work. A good job to the students. I think, you know, I we did a similar project with um, black carbon monitors and the boxes that you guys are creating are the same thing that you know UC Berkeley graduate students are are doing. So I hope I hope that you had fun and that you learned a lot and that you uh, you know understood the importance of of what the work that you're doing. I think it's you know it's just an awesome project. And my I guess my question is kind of what are the next steps? Is this uh, going to continue or are you doing outreach to to other communities and um, kind of just how the students felt about uh, the pro the project and where they like to see it go. Right, thank you, Tom. Who wants to answer that? Thank you so much for your question. I know that for in fact, we do have like one last final presentation that we will be uh, presenting to uh, our parents, teachers, and other community members at CART. So the next step is to uh, prepare for that presentation and make sure that we raise awareness. And if you guys want to add on to it as well. So for the future of our project, uh, we're opening it up to future CART students for the Environmental Science Lab. So we did do a deployment of the monitor. Uh, so that leaves it for the next CART students to uh, collect data from those monitors. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other comments or questions? Um, through the chair, I just wanted to echo some of the comments that um, Tom made in terms of the pre the presentation being, you know, very well done. And um, and you guys, you know, I mean, just great job because you are at that level in terms of hopefully you continue on in this um, effort, you know, in your studies and um, and anything that, you know, that you need as far as like support on this end of the valley, um, you know, I offer that, especially with the comment about UC Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> so again, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Any last comments or questions? If they're done, I do. Go ahead. I also echo the great work. Great work. I think it's it's awesome um, for you to be here. I know that it can be nerve wracking, um, but it's really great information, um, and uh, it's a large undertaking. And I really commend all of you for that. Um, I do have um, two questions. The first one is, what does MOOS stand for? I haven't heard that term yet. 
So unfortunately, we also do not know. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, can, I can explain. So uh, this monitor uh, is a local sensor that was, as they explained, developed by the uh, researchers at the University of Colorado at Fort Collins. When they were doing this project in Colorado, it was near dairies. So therefore, moose. But please tell them that you guys are coming up with a, that was the uh, inherited name, but they are coming up with a new name for for our sensors here in the valley. Oh, what is the new name? Yes. Yeah, so for our for the name that we want to name the monitor, we did uh, kind of think outside the box, but we also made it fun. So. Um, yeah, we used all of our initials. So it, it was uh, me, Santiago, and then it was Kyla, and then it was Yesenia, and then it was uh, Rihanna, and then it was Avery. So it's named Skyra. We just thought it was a really cool name. And yeah. <laughs> I like that. Do you, that was the, oh, the second question? The, so my second question then is, um, um, I know that, that the AM and the PM classes uh, put their monitors in different areas, um, but I, I wondered if there would be a collaboration because it looked like the AM class had it closer to the ground level, you know, like, like roof height, basically, and the other one was obviously on top of a building. I wondered if there would be a collaboration to see if there was a marked difference between say 10 or 20 feet, um, if you would see a difference and if that would be something that you would be exploring. Um, as you said, our monitors are in very different places and we don't really have many surrounding air monitors in those areas. Okay. We do have a PM 2.5 monitor in Lanier, um, but they are fairly far from other monitors. So with the difference in location and in level, it would be fairly difficult to determine what difference is made by height. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Any last questions or comments, Jessica? Uh, through the chair, if I may, just thank you all so much for being here. It was so impressive and I'm so grateful for uh, the chair to bring uh, this group to us. It's just so nice to see all the work that's being done and we can't wait to see what you guys all do, you know, in your future careers and definitely think of us. We need more, you know, smart folks like you working here. So thank you so much. They always have good openings, job yes, openings. So absolutely. Thank you. Well, thank you, students. I appreciate you being here. Um, we are, you know, uh, welcome to stay or leave, and uh, we'll continue our meeting. Thank you. Hey. Okay. <clears throat> so we're going to move to a very important topic, which is an update on Valleywide Clean Air Rooms Program. Since uh, we have to... Oh, to the chair, we were con contemplating switching, if that's okay yes. with you. By all means, please. Uh, so are we going to do the zero and near zero emission? Okay. Yes, you're like, you see, I saw it somewhere. Okay. Uh, good evening, Madam um, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Brian Dodds. I'm a program manager in our grants and incentives department. And I'm here to provide an update on our zero and near zero uh, demonstration project at the Pepsi facility, uh, Frito-Lay facility in Modesto. Um, so this project goes back several years, but it's uh, the result of a competitive solicitation process through CARB's um, zero and near zero emission freight facility project. Um, and this is a partnership between the Valley Air District and Frito-Lay, which is a, div a division of PepsiCo, and numerous project partners uh, necessary to make these types of um, innovative demonstration projects happen. And the purpose of this particular project was to implement really an industry leading showcase for environmental sustainability in manufacturing, warehousing and distribution, um, which the result will transform the 500,000 square foot uh, Modesto facility um, from gas and diesel powered equipment um, to uh, renewable energy, uh, zero and near zero emission technology. Uh, and this facility is really one of Frito-Lay's largest facilities in the United States um, with the goal of taking lessons learned and what they've been able to accomplish in Modesto uh, to facilities uh, throughout the country. 
So this project, total project cost for um, all of this is $30.8 million. Um, the grant award was roughly half, about $15.4 million, with the other $15.4 million coming in matching funds um, from, Modest, uh, excuse me, from Pepsi Frito-Lay. Uh, as I mentioned, the aim is to replace the use of diesel-powered freight equipment within the production uh, warehouse and, and their distribution facilities. This included um, deploying 15 Tesla semi-battery electric trucks, six Peterbilt uh, battery electric box trucks, which are used in local delivery, uh, three BYD battery electric yard trucks. So those are trucks that move um, big trailers around the, the warehouse, the distribution facility, um, really kind of in constant, constant motion. Uh, they've deployed 12 uh, battery electric forklifts and 38 natural gas trucks. Uh, in addition um, to the vehicles, there's a new a natural gas fueling station uh, for their natural gas trucks, a one megawatt solar carport with energy storage, and they've also got Tesla and charge point charging infrastructure and energy storage for their um, battery electric vehicles. Um, this slide just represents some of the equipment that was deployed. Um, the top left there is the natural gas fueling station along with natural gas trucks. Um, the bottom picture, if you can tell, is, a, is one of the box trucks that they use for local delivery, one of the CNG trucks. There's one of the electric yard trucks. And then on the bottom right is kind of camouflage, but is one of their forklifts. And then the top right picture is the Tesla semis that have been deployed as part of this project. Um, this facility was the first in the country to receive those vehicles. There was a, a very big um, launch in January that was all over the internet for these vehicles. And I, as I was passing through Modesto about a month and a half ago or so, I saw one of those trucks uh, traveling down 99 back to the Modesto warehouse. So it was very cool to, um, to actually see it on the road after a long time of, uh, of working to get this deployed. So the current status of the project, um, at this point, all the vehicles and equipment have been received and currently in use uh, by Pepsi Frito-Lay. Um, there's ongoing data collection um, of the vehicles that are in use to see how they're operating, ensure that the duty cycle matches um, what Pepsi Frito-Lay needs. Um, there's a lot of ongoing reporting that we need to do by CARB um, between now and basically the end of this year in order to complete the project. Um, we're, we will continue and have continued to advocate for additional state and federal funding resources to do more of these types of projects, um, certainly through the Inflation Reduction Act, um, through the infrastructure bill, um, through additional funding that CARB has. There could be more opportunities for these types of projects to bring them to the Valley. And uh, kind of tying into that, we were recently awarded funding from CARB and the CEC to deploy 50 tes Tesla battery electric trucks here in Fresno at the Pepsi Bottling Group facility in South Central Fresno. So we're very excited about that. And hopefully one day I can come back to your committee and talk to you about that project in a little bit more detail. Um, so with that, that kind of concludes the slides that I've got. We also have a quick video that uh, the Modesto Frito Lay facility put together for a launch event that we held back in January. So Brandon could pull that up. That'd be fantastic. Welcome to Frito Lay Modesto, a first of its kind showcase for sustainable manufacturing, warehousing, and distribution technologies. Frito-Lay Modesto is one of our largest manufacturing facilities in the U.S. at 500,000 square feet and employing more than 1,100 associates. And it now serves as a template for large-scale commercialization of zero-emission and near-zero-emission technologies at freight facilities and warehouses. Supported by a $15.4 million grant from the California Climate Investments Initiative in conjunction with the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District and the California Air Resources Board, Frito-Lay matched the grant with $13.5 million in cash and in-kind services. Setting out to make Frito-Lay Modesto the first Frito-Lay manufacturing facility to implement site-wide alternative fuel vehicles, on-site renewable energy generation, and energy storage. 
This project is a key driver of PepsiCo's commitment to PepsiCo Positive to build a circular and inclusive value chain, including achieving net zero emissions by 2040. It's nice to be on the cutting edge of technology and being able to work with the industry on transforming the industry and moving it towards a better environment for us all. Modesto has always been about going green. And this is just another part in our evolution of uh, Pet Positive. It's amazing that we're investing in this technology, but I, I also think it's important as a father and someone that lives in the community that you know this is great for everybody that lives here. It's, it's great for business, but it's also great for people that are gonna live and grow up here. This project is another step along our PepsiCo positive journey to operate within planetary boundaries and inspire positive change for the planet and people. Because for Frito-Lay and PepsiCo, a better food system means a better outcome for us all. Cool. Thank you, Brandon. And um, that'll conclude our presentation. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Amazing. Any questions or comments? Uh, we'll start on Modesta and come down to Fresno. I have a quick question. It's Ned Leva. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, so $30 million, $800,000. What are the expected reductions in emissions of PM2.5, NOx, SOx, VOC, let's say over five years? And so what would be the cost per ton of emissions reductions? Yeah, sure, Ned. So this project over 10 years is expected to reduce about 60 tons of uh, PM10 and NOx and 150, about 155,000 metric tons of greenhouse gases. Um, roughly, if I if I recall correctly, it's about $170,000 per ton uh, for these types of demonstration electric uh, electrification projects that sort of within the um, Cost effectiveness range that that we have right now for those types of projects. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I always encourage uh, folks to display those types of statistics as well. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments on Modesto? Go ahead, Tom. Um. Yeah. For uh, I'll start off with a comment like I did last time and just say that that um it was. Uh, all looks great. I'm glad that it's happening um, in Stanislaus County and, and in Modesto, um, especially in that um, industrial area where that facility is. So, you know, there are uh, communities, environmental justice communities nearby. So it's great to see, um, you know, th those types of things happening in those areas that can benefit from lower emissions. Um, and then my question was that um, I noticed you know, we do have the the semi, the electric semis, uh, which is very exciting to see because I know there was a lot of talk about, you know, how far off that technology was. Um, I did see that there was also 38 Volvo natural gas trucks. And I'm just curious um, I, if it said I'm, I might have missed it. But what are the difference in the trucks? Are those also semis? Are those more for the short term delivery? Is it kind of a mixture of both? I'm just curious how you kind of chose the mixture of which trucks to use for what and how that's working out. Sure. That's a great question. Um, the natural gas trucks are primarily for heavier materials for longer ranges. They're not maybe necessarily a return to base every day. The trucks that they currently have, the electric Tesla trucks that they have, um, you know, are getting a, a, a several hundred mile per day range. Um, that and they're used to you know make deliveries within that sort of radius and return to base. Um, the the natural gas trucks can go further. They, this is obviously a, a big distribution um, center that covers a lot of uh, geography. So depending on the duty cycle and the, the type of material that they're going to utilize or be, or deliver um, may dictate which type of truck that they'll need for that type of operation. So it really it really depends on the operator and and where they're going. Quick um, follow up. Um, I uh, as I'm sure folks at the air district know, 
you know, what my group is involved in a, a kind of this mock AB 617 process where we're not a chosen community, but we're putting together a group of community members. It'd be great to see uh, a presentation maybe to that group, um, if that would be possible to kind of look at possibilities on, you know, what to advocate for, for maybe facilities that are near their communities. Um, and then I didn't see the, the presentation in the email that we got. So I, it'd be great to get a copy of that so I can look over it and talk about it to, to others and then maybe link up with a, a presentation to some of the uh, community members, which I'm sure you're, you're doing, but maybe we can, um, we can have a presentation to the, uh, the, um, the steering committee members that we've been putting together. Yeah, through the chair, this is Jess. My team has been, and uh, good to see you, uh, my team has been working with some of the other local CERT groups, and we'd be happy to have someone come to one of your uh, Stanislaus meetings. Yeah. And I'm sure I, I think we can get that presentation sent out. I'll, uh, I didn't get it to our team uh, until late this afternoon, so I apologize for that, but I'm sure you'll get it distributed. And um, there are... Uh, there are community groups that are involved in this project that I'm sure would be happy to be participating in any of those discussions. Um, don't want to volunteer them uh, from here, but if those people would like to volunteer themselves, they're welcome to uh, engage in any outreach on, on this project. Thank you. Any uh, other questions I, or comments? <clears throat> yeah, um, for the chair, I wanted to add in terms of that comment for the outreach piece, just to also kind of um, basically like give an update as far as like with the community groups, we were waiting for it all to be wrapped up because it had to go through this whole corporate process too with like PepsiCo Frito-Lay. And so that's why like also like um, now that like Brian has it, so maybe Brian's going to be the point person because I've also had a lot of requests because they knew that we were working on the project but we couldn't really um, put it out there publicly until everything was finalized and they're still, you know, providing data, what have you. There's still even some additional information, like as far as um, like social media, what have you. But now that it's like finalized in a sense, I think that we can then push that out there. So it has, we weren't able to push it previously, but now we can. And so I really appreciate the fact that your group is interested in that. And I think that um, once we have more clarification as far as like, not just like the actual presentation, but like maybe somebody from the staff or even somebody like from Frito-Lay for like the bigger presentations, we're gonna um, hopefully move forward on that, right? <laughs> because that's, that's the cool. ask that I've had like in the past couple of meetings, you know, with Frito-Lay. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, uh, we're gonna move to Fresno. I've been waiting for an update on this. Mm -hmm. This is great. Um, the what is the and you may not even know the answer, but what is the lifespan of these vehicles? So that's a big part of these demonstration projects is really trying to figure out, you know, how long they're going to operate. Um, mm -hmm. The expectation is that they would provide the same use as a traditional diesel truck. Okay. Um, and that can vary from fleet to fleet, but that's that's part of this. And we're going to find out and see this is brand new technology. Um, so we're our expectations are high, but we want to see what the next couple of years looks like for sure. That'd be awesome if they could last 15, 20 years. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, you know, just kind of a rhetorical question. When the mechanic opened up the, the hood on the, the EV truck, did he like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean that that is a great question though. Yeah. But part of <clears throat> part of this project um, is training the yeah. mechanics to work on these types of trucks. Um, they're used to the diesel trucks; they know what they can do. Um, these electric trucks are different, so mm -hmm. there is a component of the manufacturer providing information to the end user um, that is going to you know maintain these trucks and what their expectations are. I sit on another <clears throat> another board that we gave out scholarships earlier. <clears throat> Excuse me, had allergy voice. Um, anyway, a couple of our scholarship recipients were going into uh, diesel mechanics, and uh, I was so excited about that. And I said, because you're not going into diesel mechanics, you are going to switch over to you know electric or natural gas sure. or something like that. And I said, and they, they kind of looked at me, and I said. I mean, I'm just being honest, you know, we are already seeing 
electric tractors are already seeing electric everything. And I said that I'm really excited to have young people, you know, going to diesel mechanic school when we really know that it's going to be everything. And uh, so I'm really looking forward to updates on this. Great project. Thank you. Thank you. I have a couple of questions. <clears throat> well, um, I would also request a presentation because I'm doing the same thing, but in, in Tulare, in Terra Vela, actually a meeting is happening right now that I'm missing because I'm here. So uh, one of the main sources of uh, pollution that the community members have expressed is the pollution coming from all the diesel trucks going around their community because of the huge uh, you know, processing plants that they have, especially pistachios and other crops. Uh, so I think, you know, Obviously, this is probably not in the, the moment to be replicated widely, but so, so that they know that there's, you know, a roadmap in that direction. And that leads to my next question. So how I, I understand that we learn from these pilots and then, you know, see what things need to be adjusted. But what are the plans to try to replicate this in beyond the Modesto plan and the Fresno plan? And also... Uh, where are we with the Fresno plant? And lastly, um, what's the cost of an electric uh, Tesla truck? Sure. There's a lot to unpack there. Um, first, I, may, maybe to your first point. So it's very difficult, you know, to have $15 million in funding for one facility. It happens from time to time, right? But um, can't do that every day. But we do have funding currently. Um, available for fleets that might want to replace their existing diesel trucks with optional low NOx or electric trucks. So they could come in today, fill out an application, and probably be funded very quickly, assuming that they meet the eligibility criteria for the program. So we do have funding for trucks. At any time, we're happy to talk to any fleet that's interested in that technology. There are additional funding opportunities that I think are coming through CARB's um, pipeline. Um, and we're continuing to meet with fleets that might be interested in this type of technology or, um, you know, folks that are advancing, um, you know, electric truck technology um, through infrastructure or deploying additional trucks. So um, there's a lot going on in this space right now. And I think this is just kind of the we're getting to the, the peak. We've been going up slowly and I think it's going to take off here pretty soon in, in terms of um, a little bit more of the widespread deployment. In terms of cost, it really varies quite widely right now. Um, you know, anywhere from uh, $300,000 for some truck manufacturers up to six or $700,000 for, for other manufacturers. Um, if you compare that to the cost of a diesel truck, it is, um, you know, a fairly substantial increase. With our incentives, um, they vary depending on fleet size and cost of vehicle and, and a number of um, kind of factors there. Um, we can provide up to about $400,000 in funding for an electric truck, as long as that's not more than, we're kind of capped out at about 50% of the cost. So it depends, the goal is to offset the incremental cost compared to a diesel truck, but th there is funding and we're we're happy to, to talk to people about it and encourage people to to come and talk to us and participate in the program. Well, those are excellent news. Thank you. We'll follow up on that request of the presentation and the funding that is available to make it happen. Sure. Right. Thank you. I have a follow up question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, when you talk about fleets. Are you talking about um, like the large um, warehouse fleets or are um, like smaller, smaller uh, organizations that have like maybe five to 10 trucks? Any, any fleets. Anything. It can be small fleets. It can be large fleets. Small fleets sometimes get a little bit of a priority or a little bit extra bump in funding to, to help out because, okay. you know, they might be a little bit more financially impacted. But really at this point, we're looking for all fleets, anyone who might Looking be interested. Everything. Okay, Absolutely. thank you very much. Appreciate thank you. It. No problem. Thank you. Um, so are we ready to move to the item that we skip? Okay, I'm super happy and excited to hear the update on the Clean Air Rooms program. Yes, 
Awesome. Well, good evening, everyone. And thanks again for letting me um, help, you know, support these meetings. And I'm grateful to be here um, really just in response to the last meeting. The last meeting that we had, I gave an update on AB 617 air filtration programs. They were very much focused on three communities. And the update I have for you today is that um, within those couple of months, we um, found funding, air district funding, to make sure that we could do a valley-wide deployment. So I'm going to talk about that in a little detail here. Um, but of course, as unfortunately, as we know, and, and you know, we were fortunate a little bit last year, but really in the past several years, we've seen increased smoke impacts from wildfires. Um, and we know that ensuring a safe indoor space during smoke events is one of the best ways we can protect the health of the community residents throughout the valley. In June of last year, we launched a pilot program called our Clean Air Rooms Pilot Program. And we used funding to support just free deployment of air filtration devices at zero cost to residents. Um, they got a device and um, a replacement filter directly to residents that lived within disadvantaged communities as defined by Cal Screen. So we collaborated, we, because it was such a small number, it was $250,000, um, which was about 12 to, 12 to 1,300 devices. And so because it was so small and we knew we wanted to target the groups and communities we knew needed it the most, we did a very small, very intimate discussion with a lot of community groups who did sort of the advocacy and outreach for that, us. Um, we heard a lot from those community groups. We heard from your group, the, the EJAG. We heard from the district governing board that this was such a success, and they have heard so much feedback about folks that were unable to participate, and that is very important to them that we bring back a valley-wide program. And like I mentioned just a moment ago, we had we did this just two months ago through the SERP or the uh, Community Emissions Reduction Programs for those other three communities. So we're kind of piggybacking off of the momentum there with this program today. Um, so this is just a little bit of background on kind of what the devices are. So they're high efficiency particulate air filtration devices. Um, they were in well sealed indoor air environments, which is part of the you know important part here. Um, they can really um, reduce the particulate matter by more than 90%, which is huge in these smoke events. And you maybe sometimes smell the smoke right in your home. Um, it is so important, I think, for each one of us, right, to hopefully have one of these, but of course, to make sure that vulnerable community members can get them as well. Um, we also work with CARB. CARB actually maintains a list of approved devices. That's because some air filtration devices use a technology like ionization technology that actually can create ozone pollution. So it's not a good way to use the device. We're using actual like physical air filtration barriers. That's what those HEPA filters are. So we look to CARB's list. Um, as sort of our baseline for what air filtration devices we're looking for. Um, so increasingly encouraging folks to use them has been a big part of our outreach campaign um, and making sure we uh, look to um, partner with community organizations like we did last summer moving forward to distribute air filtration devices. So a little bit of what, um, and it says proposed, but I should mention this was actually approved by the board last Thursday. Yes. So actual funding level, um, the, the total is uh, um, one million dollars. Um, so it's four times what we did last summer. Um, the eligibility and the funding distribution will remain the same. So we are targeting residents, of course, within the district boundaries, so not just 617 folks, um, residing within identified disadvantaged communities. We're going to use Cal Enviro Screen. There's also a new tool called EPA EJ Screen, which is an important other kind of tool to take a look at and make sure that we're capturing all the folks we need to. And then, of course, um, and, and we've worked really closely with community members that have helped us with this. Really, the application is, is simple. Um, it's very short and straightforward. But one of the things we do ask for is a proof of residency. And we're work, working with folks. Yeah, we ask it's like a pg and &E bill or a water bill. Um, and we've been great at not only at working with folks, but working with community members and community leaders to help us get those residents that maybe didn't know quite what that meant or quite what bill to send to make sure we still could get them in the program. Um, what we've done is, um, in terms of distribution, is we allocated the program just like last summer based on population within each county on a first-come, first-served basis. Um, and so we'll, we'll see as program demand, um, kind of once we open up the program, how it fluctuates and whether we need to shift funding from certain counties. Maybe some aren't expending it and some are well expended very early on um, and definitely come back to, um, to shift if necessary. I did put this in here 
Um, this was in the governing board. This is just that that exact breakdown of what it means. So if we were to do $1 million worth of devices, um, this is the breakdown of how much we would spend per county. Um, and so it amounts to, for kind of the larger counties, it amounts to like about 900 to 1,000 devices for the larger counties like San Joaquin, Fresno, and Kern, and then kind of goes down a little bit from there. And then just a little bit more about the distribution method. If you recall, for those that were really involved, and I think many of you were last time, um, we would purchase the CARB certified um, air purifiers. We actually are currently going through what's called a request for quotations to get vendors to make sure that they supply us with the most cost-effective but still efficient devices. So we're definitely taking into account what we learned last year about this distribution. Um, we want to partner with the, the manufacturer to do a direct distribution, just like we did last time. So it shows up on folks' doorsteps. Um, we were able, in some cases, if folks said, hey, it never arrived, we were able to immediately make sure it, we sent another one out. Um, with the replacement filter, it's about 150 to 300 where, you know, again, we're getting those quotations, but we'll see if that's similar to the, um, the last deployment. But again, this will allow us on the low end, which we do not expect to about, you know, 3,300, but we really think it'll be closer to about 6,000, um, maybe close to 7,000 units that we can distribute across the Valley. And again, ship directly to participants mailing addresses. Um, so this is a picture of one of the devices that we had, um, and maybe some of you, I'm not sure if folks participated or were helping other folks who participated, um, but just next steps, we will be entering into agreements with those vendors during that competitive process that's ongoing right now. We're piggybacking actually off of the momentum we already had with 617. So we're hoping to be able to do this really before quote unquote wildfire season. Um, I know we have a lot of water and there's a lot going on, so it's hard to imagine, but we can also imagine that a lot grew because of all the water, right? And so we potentially might have a lot of fuel up there and it could potentially be one of those seasons, right? So um, of course, we'll continue to partner with local organizations. Given that it's a little bit bigger deployment, we might work together to be a little bit bigger outreach, but also still wanting to maintain that hey, let's target the folks we know need it the most, the folks that we work with, the folks with asthma, the folks in our programs. Um, and then, of course, continue to seek out state and federal funding opportunities. We're already working. Um, men Brian mentioned a lot of the um, Inflation Reduction Act and bi bipartisan infrastructure law funding. We're continuing to look at places there to secure funding for this exact program. So I just wanted to update you on that as well. And that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take questions or just talk about this program. Any takers who wants to ask questions or I see um, a hand raise, is that you? It's, it's Ned Leva, if you can hear me. A compliment, of course, and a comment, of course. The compliment is this is a very, very good program. We're reducing exposure to people who are at risk and the cost is low. It's very effective. And I always say this, I compare this to whatever you've guys shown before. In this case, of course, we talked about Frito-Lay, but before we talked about electric buses, $1 million was the cost per metric ton of reducing some admissions. You know, $177,000 per metric ton is enormous costs. Okay, this is low cost. It has nothing to do with exposure, ambient exposure. We already meet the EPA standards for PM 2.5 and even exceed them in most most locations of the district. Here, we're hitting people who need the help. And so I would strongly advocate to everyone here, everyone on the board, this is the type of program we should put money behind. It's really good. Okay, and the suggestion I made actually at the AB617, and I need to follow up, I talked to a pulmonologist. I said, gee, this is a great program. You as a pulmonologist have people with COPD, asthma, whatever. Uh, would you be interested in communicating with the Air District? They said yes. And so, again, I would encourage your outreach to the pulmonologist as well as the asthma community. This is gold, and uh, I just hope you everyone supports it. Thank you. Okay. Um Again, thank you, Jessica. And I had a question. Um, I don't recall from the last program, did mm -hmm. um, you all connect with like the HEAT program with the um, that the Home Energy Assistance Program? And then if 
if so, you know, there's also like the medical baseline program that's through, um, you know, the different utility companies like PG&E and Southern California Edison. Um, so that being said, I'm, I'm just thinking like, especially, you know, you know, adding on to Ned's comment. So for those most affected, you know, that have like a, a medical issue and or like most vulnerable in terms of seniors, what have you, because they're already approached by all these programs. Mm -hmm. So then kind of like coupling that up would kind of make sense. Right. And then even though you're not going to have enough devices for everyone, but maybe, um, for example, because you know how they update on the heat program, they assist them also with um, the air conditioning, heating mm -hmm. and what have you to um, get that up to par. Right. And they have like this long waiting list. And so then that kind of might be like a, an easy go to because then it's like, whereas like, you know, some of you we work with all these different people that need it. But I think like in working with the most like um, vulnerable, like the seniors and the um, and those that, you know, suffer um, from a, a medical condition. So that's kind of like what I was looking at in terms of that, because we did some of the outreach for some of them. So that's why I was thinking if it was layered, it could help. And then as mm -hmm. far as the federal funding that you talked about, mm -hmm. um, do you foresee that happening sometime soon? Because obviously this is a, a much needed device for for our residents. Yes, I can answer both questions. So, yes, yeah, so certainly, and I, I wrote and noted kind of differently, I think, than we were originally approaching it is outreach through the HEAP program and medical baseline program. So we'll definitely follow up on that and I'll work with the outreach team. I think that's a great idea. One of the things I failed to mention, though, is that we do want to, and this was something that came actually through the discussions with the 617 communities, is make sure when folks are, are receiving information about this, they're also receiving information about those programs. So it's kind of a two-way street. Um, because something I mentioned earlier that was in the slides is in a well-sealed indoor air and environment. And oftentimes, or not, um, perhaps oftentimes, there are communities, right, that live in homes that are not properly weatherized. And so you're essentially working extra hard or the, the air filtration device is if it's not in a properly sealed environment. And every single county in the valley has state funding to do weatherization work for low-income folks. And so we want to definitely work both ways to make sure that folks are available or able to take advantage of that. Um, in terms of timing, some of the federal funding that we're hoping and that we want to continue to, to strive for um, probably won't be this summer. So that was actually part of the big push, especially from hearing from you all a couple months ago, hearing from our board and other community groups, was to look for, and you saw it in the slides, district funding for this while we continue to seek additional funding. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Uh, I'll make a comment um, and a question again. Um, uh, funny enough, today, uh, the day that we happened to have this meeting, I was contacted by a reporter from uh, NPR, I believe, she does radio, and she said that she called me because she found a quote from 2016 at one of these meetings where we were talking about wildfires. This is 2016, so before some of the major wildfires. And we were talking about the um, how the um, now I'm forgetting the term the uh, uh, event the um, how how fires don't count against um, you know the air pollution because it's an extraordinary event that's not the term but it, that's a good exceptional event I believe exceptional is the event term. there yeah. you go yeah and that I just kind of you know this was back then like I said before a lot of the wildfire stuff. And I just made some comment about, well, do you think with, you know, all the projections about how wildfires are going to get worse, are we always going to be able to count that as an exceptional event? And she was following up all these years later because they're doing a report about how is California and the country preparing for wildfires and how can, uh, you know, agencies like the Air District, which, you know, don't manage forests, but you know, kind of what are we going to do? And she wanted to follow up on the, on the quote that I had. And so it's great that we're talking about this because I was like, yeah, you're right. I don't really know the answer besides working with other agencies who have jurisdiction over that. But really, this is the, the solution for us locally is to at least help clean the air for folks, have a place to go um, that or, are filtered. So this is a great program. I'm glad to see it getting more funding. I know Stanislaus County 
was a little slow in getting them out. So hopefully we can get out in front of that and really, you know, have people ready to be able to um, accept those. And I think, you know, the future is going to be, we need to reach all of these homes. I myself, I've majority of homes I lived in did not have an air conditioner. They had a swamp cooler, which the filtration is, is not very good. Um, so, you know, I think that that looking forward, that's something that we really need to get behind and, and have some funding behind. And then my, my question after all of that is, I know you said that you took into account um, the populations, but also um, AB 617 communities, they are also have funding for these. Um, so I'm wondering uh, how you looked at kind of hot spots in the valley where you know, the, the air is already worse and, and the mm. wildfires are just going to make it that much more worse. Because mm. I, I do agree that population is a good way um, to also look at it, but also kind of looking at those areas um, that need that, that extra support and how that went mm. into deciding where the where the, the filters will go. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I think one one way to answer that actually is to your point about the 617 communities, but we also, of course, know that there are other EJ communities that were not selected. Um, looking at population, really because this was driven so much by wildfire impacts, and knowing that we were targeting exclusively within those disadvantaged communities as defined by those tools, wildfire smoke tends to, uh, because it's hard to predict where the fires are, tends to be a very regional pollutant. So at least for this round of this kind of exclusive, even though it's so much more than we've had, it's still not enough, right? We can acknowledge that um, this exclusive amount of funding, we still did it population-based just to distribute it across the valley. Um, but I do see as, and these are great notes for us, as we look for more funding and as we add more to this and hopefully continue this program to take into account some of the health things that I've already heard tonight. Um, but also, I think to your point, maybe some of the other air quality metrics as we move forward. Thank you. I'm really excited that the district is putting so much more money into it. I think that that's really exciting. And um, my question is, is more aesthetically, how big are these units? And um, how are they loud? Are they quiet? Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I, I don't know, Miss Martinez, if you have a. No, they are not uh, loud, and you can, you know, increase or not the intensity. Um, so I, I've seen it uh, because we have compared those to like the do-it-yourself like uh, devices that are is a fun uh -huh. box, uh, and those are really loud yeah. and bulky. So people that did not get those, we were giving them the do-it-yourself ones, and they were like, "Oh, I can't wait to get the other one because they were noisier and the size, especially if you have a small home, it was very inconvenient." But these ones are not that they're big and they're, they're and really quiet. some people even find it uh soothing like because white they noise? say like white noise yes thank you thank you um i do have a couple of questions so uh i mean i i really think i i'm super happy because i i that's what we wanted right we wanted these uh re for the entire valley and not only ab617 community but also because we're not going to have yet all the funding to to give this out to every single household that needs it even when they meet the the criteria of living in a disadvantaged community i just want to make sure that we are you know spreading the loss and trying to avoid dupl duplication so for example um Making sure that if people got one in the first round, uh, that you know we don't get you know uh, double dipping. Second, I would start with the people that are in the wait list because mm -hmm. they were like uh, they were not of filter you know devices, and I need one. So I, I, that would be my recommendation: start with the waiting list, uh, and then move into you know the the average for new communities. I also want to ensure that uh, although I completely echo the importance of prioritizing sensitive populations like elders or asthmatic uh, people, we also need to be aware of some of these programs that are already giving these devices to them. I remember at the Air District Board meeting when Kevin mentioned that, that for example, the program that his organization runs is already providing these devices for those households with asthma. So how we can have an inventory of all those resources that are already there 
so that we can fill in the gaps, at least until we'll secure more funding, mm -hmm. so that it really goes to fill those homes that right now have nothing. Um, that will be my, my recommendation. Yeah, thank you for all of that. I will say that starting with the wait list is definitely one of our priorities. We also continued afterwards to take folks' information, even though it, so the wait list had closed, but we still had like an information. So, so starting with those folks is certainly the priority. Uh, no double dipping is another one to your point. Um, and yes, we have been following up with Kevin to find the best way to make sure that happens. So thank you for those recommendations. Okay. Last chance for comments or questions. If not, we're going to move on. Great. So district comments. Yes, thank you. So normally these are deputy APCO or APCO comments. I am neither. Um, I am uh, the director of community strategies and resources. Um, and we moved them to the end tonight because of the that we wanted the cart folks, you know, the kids to be able to get home. Um, but I'm happy to work with the chair to see where these fit regularly. Um, so I just wanted to make a couple of things that happened at our last board meeting. Um, as you may have noticed, uh, with the go governing board reappointed uh, Mr. Dennis Brazil, our Merced um, County at-large representative, and Mayor Richard O'Brien, um, who was Re, uh, recommended for reappointment by the CAC at their April meeting um, as our CAC city interest group representative. So of course that happened and welcome and thank you all for, for being here. Um, kind of an odd comment at the end of the meeting, but um, we also um, recently, this was just last Thursday, we had our city selection committee meeting for appointing new governing board members. And so um, out of that came two new governing board members. One is our large city representative. Um, this is council member Rosa Escuta Bratan from city of Modesto and small city representative is the council member uh, Gilberto Reina from the city of Wasco. So they will be attending our May meeting and they um, round out our, our governing board. Um, we also have our end of season residential wood smoke strategy that report went to our board. We tend to do that in March, April timeframe. It's the end of what we're now calling our wood smoke reduction strategy. We used to call it like our winter season or wood burning season, but we're straying away from that. We don't want it to be known as wood burning season. Um, this was our fourth season in our current um, amendments to rule 4901, which is our wood smoke reduction or, or wood burning rule for residential fireplaces. And that's the one that has the lower threshold for the hotspot counties. Um, and so uh, this past year uh, was actually our record set number of good air quality di days. Um, and I'm sure we all noticed that, right? And I, just as a reminder, this is from November 1st through the end of February. Um, we only had two across the entire valley, only two unhealthy or above air quality index days and zero days exceeding the 65. And that's actually like the fourth year in a row we've not exceeded the 65 on any one single day. And all the numbers I'm talking about here are 24 hour averages. Um, just a couple of other stats that we shared. Um, we also set a record low average of PM 2.5 concentration. So not just day by day, how many were good or how many were poor, but on just on average across those four months. Um, so just a lot of great, um, I think, progress um, a lot of our data analysis from what we call speciation, where we collect the PM 2.5 and try to analyze what the species are, indicate that it was less um, wood burning happening. So a lot of good outreach, um, certainly a lot of good engagement. Um, I have some numbers here. Um, it seems like uh, high numbers, so I don't know where this stands kind of in your brain, but it feels like a lot. We had over 30 sorry, 332,000 visits just to our residential wood smoke reduction program page. And on that page, that's where you can find the curtailment. That's where you find out how to change out your fireplace. So we know that lots of folks are getting information, not only about how bad wood burning is for them, but then what to do about it. Um, and then we also had 487 public complaints for wood burning activity. We issued 600 74 notices of violation for this season. So there was still a lot of active compliance and a lot of active like community compliance and community members helping call in. Um, so we just think it was a really successful season. Um, and we, of course, look forward to, you know, continuing to um, ramp up for next year. There's all, all this time and something that I'm going to share with you actually in a video here in a minute. This is kind of the time of year people don't really think about changing out their fireplace, but we actually want to capitalize on a couple of things that happen this time of year um, and, and really do a lot of outreach. And one of those things is you can get paid not only to change out your fireplace to natural gas, 
Um, but you can also get paid to change it out to what we call a heat pump. And what folks don't quite realize is that a heat pump doesn't just pump heat. Um, you can use it as an air conditioning unit. And so this is the time of year folks are now that it, we were just talking about how hot it is, at least here in Fresno. I'm not sure about up north um, up there. Um, so folks are thinking, oh, my gosh, is my air conditioning unit going to make it? And we have um, up to five thousand dollars for folks to change um, out their fireplace and get a heat pump that can serve as both air conditioning and heating. So I want to actually share a video of a community member um, who did just that. I'm Connie Young. I'm a retired registered nurse. I found out about a program through the Air District that would provide several thousand dollars if I were to disable my fireplace and switch over to a heat pump. The advantage of a heat pump is that it doesn't burn any fossil fuels to run it. Um, and it's extremely efficient. And this is one real simple thing that we can do to improve our air quality and our quality of life in this valley. That, oh, maybe we can go, I, that, what, next, that was next to her? That, or that, that, yeah, that image that, yes. The one on the roof was her old, um, her old AC unit. Yes, the heat pump is much more compact um, and, um, yeah, much more efficient than that old unit that's on her roof. Um, and so one of the things uh, I just wanted to mention is that particular, yeah, so that, that's her old AC unit that you see up there. Yeah. Thank you, Brandon. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention is that that um, video that you just saw is part of uh, several videos that we want to do, a campaign showing real community residents, especially folks like Connie Young. If you ever come to our governing board meetings, she comments at every meeting um, and a really active community member and an advocate for clean air. And we want to highlight real people getting real incentives because one of the things we find, and I know a lot of you find through your work, is sometimes folks don't believe us. So you saw the tag at the bottom there, believe it. That is a quote we heard and you'll hear in some of our upcoming, and I can't wait to share them with you, some of our other upcoming interviews we've done with folks across the valley um, receiving some of these incentives. So we're really excited about that. I also am going to squeeze in a 617 update if I can, um, because I fail, uh, failed to put it on the, on the agenda, but I'm here and I'm the one that typically does it. So I just wanted to provide a couple of updates um, and one that I actually didn't write down, but I just, I, I think um, Mr. Helm made a, such a great point. I just want to acknowledge that there are, so 617, there's work happening at the district. There's also community air grant funding that's distributed to a variety of different community groups across the state. Um, and many of them are here in the Valley. Um, and many of them are, are, are your groups or the groups that you all work with. And so some of those groups are working on, uh, in smaller communities that have not been selected, um, as uh, Tom mentioned, for 617 work. But the district is committed to helping and we're showing up. We are actually at the meeting tonight that Nineen and I both could not make um, in, down in Terabella, but we're helping support all of those. And I definitely look forward to not only updating you all in the future on the District 617 work, but just kind of the work we're seeing across the valley um, for community engagement in these EJ communities. Um, a couple of other quick things is we've talked with you all in the past. CARB has to approve through something we call a project plan. Any of the funding we use that's outside of like traditional um, funding, at pretty much any of the innovative cool projects we do, we have to work with CARB um, on, on getting approval to use the community air protection or CAP incentive funding. So even though it's in the SERP, we still have to work through this approval process. We have been, um, I just am proud to say, and just very grateful for the collaboration with the CSCs and with CARB. Um, we've had a lot of recent approvals and we're moving forward on a lot of really cool innovative projects. So I just want to thank everyone on all the CSCs that have been working hard on that. Um, one of the one of the cool ones that we're really looking forward to is a big sidewalk installation down in Lamont um, and, and the Arvin area. Um, but it, particularly in Lamont, the CSC agreed on four different projects. We're moving forward. We already have approval from CARB. We'll work with our board. So just a lot of really cool projects we're not normally able to do kind of with our traditional funding streams. And then finally, um, one of the things that's important to us in, in the CSCs is resident involvement. Um, in some of the CSCs, there are a lot of residents and they're very involved. And some of them, there are not as many. And we just, I want to thank the CSC members who have helped us. Um, we've recruited in Arvin Lamont and in South Central Fresno, 
a, a handful of CSC members. Um, we've done, I think there's about six new ones in Arvin Lamont and about eight um, in Fresno. Um, and we're hoping to get maybe even a few more, um, but we're looking forward to onboarding those new members and continuing, even though we're almost, we're more than halfway done with the SERP implementation, it's important that we still hear resident voices. So now with all of that, I got to talk so much at the end. Um, I'm happy to take comments or questions or any other uh, thoughts you all have for me. We'll start with Fresno today. <laughs> well, right now. Just a comment. Great work. Just great work, Jessica. Thanks. Modesto? I got a question. Um, I'm curious. You, you mentioned that there was 400 and something reports for the uh, wood burning, mm -hmm. um, but that there was 600 something violations. I was just curious, is it, um, is there kind of a, a proactive, um, yeah. you know, crew that, that goes out looking or is this like you're on your mm -hmm. way to a complaint and you see a couple more? I'm just curious how you Great end up question. getting those extra 200. Yes, we do nightly surveillance um, or daily. Anytime there's a curtailment, we're always constantly doing surveillance. So um, in addition to public complaints, we are actually actively, to your point, being proactive about looking for uh, folks that are violating the wood burning rule. And so um, I don't have a breakdown of how many of those notices came from complaints or from surveillance, but it's certainly a mix. Um, and even in certain um, areas where we already know that there are violators, we definitely do a concerted effort um, and are proactive there as well. I do have a follow-up comment on that regard. Um, as a student mentioned, one chronic problem in the community of Lenair is burning. Burning not only of wood and fireplaces, but sadly of trash. Uh, so, you know, some of the community concerns are, uh, I know we have in the, in the we're going to be planning a meeting where you will come and provide more information to community members. Uh, uh, but also I think that if at all possible, there could be some more uh, inspectors going on uh, to catch these guys, because sometimes what has happened is that, you know, Lenair is almost, you know, 45 minutes away, right? So by the time that the resident makes a report and all that, you know, the fire might have been, but you can still see the residues. But anyhow, I just wanted to see if that could be possible. Um, when you identify this like chronic places for either fireplace burning or other type of illegal burning if you can target those. Yeah, thank you. I'll definitely work with our compliance team. And I will also say it's not always the case, but oftentimes if we get a complaint and we need to respond, there are folks, especially if it's during the workday, that are already out. And so we try to find the closest person to respond. So that might not be coming just from the Fresno office. They might be closer. But to your point, I'll, I'll um, talk with the compliance team and take that into consideration. Thank you. Any other questions or comments uh, from Modesto? Um, yeah, I have. I just have a question, um, Jessica, on that, um, the heat pump. So then that can be one of the choices for that fireplace replacement. Is is that or yes. is it separate? Oh, okay. No, it's okay. right now it's it's the it's all one and the same. So I will say you do have you can't it can't be someone that does not currently have a fireplace. You have to still disable a wood burning device and then replace it with the heat pump to be eligible for the current incentive. Okay, thank you. I was reading them that I saw the press release in my phone and I went, ah, and interestingly enough, we were in a bus coming back from Sacramento and the bus driver heard and say, oh, read me more about that. I want to see if I'm eligible, but he didn't have a fireplace. So I'm like, okay, well, never mind. Okay. Thank you. Um, I've been skipping the public comment request, so are there any public comments? Sorry. Do we have any public comments in Bakersfield? There are no public comments in Bakersfield. Thank you. Are there any public comments in Modesto? No public comments in Modesto. Thank you. There are no members of the public present in Fresno, and there's no indication of any comments online. Okay, thank you. Uh, so moving us on, a potential future EJAG meeting agenda item. Any requests for presentations or updates? Um, I just have a comment on, on uh, how we present uh, some major items, such as let's uh, say you did the 
Frito Lay, future you do PepsiCo, um, and there's a, a lot of investment into private companies. Um, and let's say it's 50-50 like it was with Frito-Lay. What is the ROI for Frito-Lay? And during that ROI, uh, what is the metric tons that you expect of the, the pollutants? Which ones you identify? What is the cost per metric ton? And basically, when you invest $15 million, you're losing opportunities. What opportunities are you giving up? Are you giving up... Um, let's say 500 tractors, and does that balance out in your uh, the, the pollutants that you, you resolve? And then in particular, since we're EJAG, what community are you targeting? Is it the in, no community at all, is it just um, pollution or environment, or is it a, a specific target? Because uh, there may be some um, um, areas around Frito-Lay, but I don't think they're that close. That are that could be targeted for um, cleaning up for environmental justice, but um, since we're environmental justice, might as well do that. Or, or do you understand what I'm trying to get at, because I like Ed uh, Ned's um, comment. How much does it cost, and is it well worth our money? Like uh, the the clean rooms are well worth our money. Yeah, through the chair, I can answer. So I believe, and I don't have Brian Dodds, who's the expert, I believe he mentioned it was about $100,000 per ton, which for large demonstration projects, it sounds like is, you know, closer to, to that type of um, that uh, cost effectiveness that we see for projects like that. Um, I can't speak directly for the communities directly surrounding, but warehouses tend to be, uh, especially recently in a lot of the community work that we do, one of the biggest sources of concern for folks, um, not only because the activity occurring there, but because the large deployment of trucks in and out that might drive by communities on their way to and from the warehouses. And I'll just also acknowledge that the project, I don't think we got a chance. I do, I do remember actually the chair asking a question and I didn't, we did not get an update, but there is the secondary project um, with 50 trucks to deploy in the South Central Fresno community. I know for a fact, um, based on all of the, the robust work we do there, that that, is, that surrounds a lot of community members um, in some of the highest ranked Cal and Virus Green areas. So certainly targeting communities, but I do appreciate the point and I'll work, make sure to connect with the incentives team about making sure that these projects, um, you know, of course, still make sure, you know, we're targeting the communities that need it the most when it comes to this amount of funding. Just a comment on your comment. Um, I believe it was over a 10-year period. The ROI probably is a lot less than 10 years. If I'm an investment, a business investing, I want that ROI down to seven, maybe even five years. So you're targeting five years because after that, now it's all pure profit that they get because they have no fuel cost, their maintenance on their trucks is 20% of what it was for a diesel truck. Now, there's a whole lot of other uh, uh, incentives for that company, but that ROI is important uh, for our input for the monies, public monies, and what we, we need to get out of it. Yeah, I, I noted, and I don't have the ROI right in front of me. I will also just uh, acknowledge that it takes big companies that can afford like Pepsi, Frito-Lay, to do these demonstration projects to encourage the smaller fleets that we talked about a little bit earlier and encourage them and let them know that this is a possible project. Because I will say some of the funding that Brian mentioned that is available now, we aren't seeing folks interested in taking it. They're afraid of electric trucks. They're afraid of the transition. And so, um, but no, that excellent point. I don't have that number in front of me, um, but I will say we do find it important to partner with folks that are able to take on the risk of these projects um, to make sure that there's kind of good messaging out there about them. Uh, I have a comment about all that. I, I think that to me is not like either or. I think we need to keep on giving these devices that improve indoor air quality, but we do not need to give up on other reductions that we need. And um, I'm I if I'm not mistaken, Tom mentioned that there are EJ communities near to this facility. So 
I'm not a expert. I don't live in that county, so I'm taking his word for it. I do say that here in Fresno, it's a top priority for all the residents of South Fresno and especially those living in the AB 617 community. So for us, it was music to our ears to hear this because um, all these diesel trucks that are going to be replaced really represents a lot of uh, mitigation and reduction. So beyond the number, I think that the number that we're not calculating is how many uh, days are we avoiding of a, an asthmatic kid to go to the ER and the, the parents missing a date of work. So it's not only about the investment, return investment for a company, it's about the, the health impact in communities. And I think that the health impact could and should not be reduced to just giving them a, a purify, an air purifier that cleans their inside their house. But the moment that they step out, they're still breathing these, you know, uh, fumes for PM diesel. So um, that's just my my personal point. Um, just to make it another quick comment. Um, uh, yeah, there's no there's no community like right across the street from Frito, but I was gonna try to look on my phone real quick to try, see. Try. It, yeah, and I mean, you know, the Air District has told us before. Some of our pollution comes from the Bay Area, some even all the way from China. So I'm sure, you know, it, it's it's going somewhere and the areas that would be closest, closely affected are, are EJ communities like Empire or the, or the airport community or, or uh, you know, part of Ceres. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, I'm, I'm all for making sure that, you know, these are good investments that are bringing a, a good return to our communities. Like Naimeen said, you know, hospital visits, days off of work, uh, having to take days off of work. There's also kind of this experimental aspect to it where, like was said, you know, companies are a little worried about investing in somebody's got to kind of see if it works first, right? So it's hard to put a put a price on that. Um, but I, I think it's, it's obviously a valid point. I made the same point about, uh, you know, in Turlock, they they are finishing up uh, another Amazon warehouse for the county. The other ones in in Patterson. That area of Turlock on Calenviro screen is it's the highest for PM in San Estes County. It's one of the highest uh, in the, I think it's like 93rd percentile for the whole state of California. You know I said if a if a company worth as much as Amazon is coming into an area like that, they should be required to have all electric trucks. But you know, the, you'd have to, you know, talk to folks at uh, in Turlock who, who make those decisions, which, you know, it's kind of probably too late for them. But there is a model for doing things like that, of having a, a benefit uh, agreement for the local community. Um, and sometimes they're, they're willing to, you know, cough up a little bit of money to buy the nearest community's air purifiers or to make a promise that they're going to electrify some trucks or something like that. So, it is important to, to keep in mind and it's important to somebody's got to kind of stick their neck out there and invest the money and to see how good these things work. And hopefully it it, it expands and it is a good investment uh, in the long term. So just wanted to say that. Thank you. Madam, so, uh, sorry. Madam Chair, this is Dennis Brazil. I, and this is probably a question for Jessica. I know there's an alternative diesel fuel that's out. Um, I see it on social media, on the internet. I don't really see much of it in the communities. And I, one of the triggers was the price. It's almost double the cost of the diesel fuel anywhere in the state of California. I'm just curious if the district has any information on it. I don't, I'm happy to, to send out information and find out more. You might be talking about like renewable diesel fuel when you're talking about alternatives? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I'm happy to, to find out more. I, I know there are operations and folks working on projects. Um, I, I believe in the Valley, but I don't have any information on that. And I'm happy to get information to you. Great. Thank you so much. One last request for suggestions of uh, future items for our meeting in June. So I um, think... Oh, sorry. Sorry, SB. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. So I think that that we obviously uh, you know we're all really interested in this the Frito Lay Pepsi uh, project and would like updates 
as often as we can. I know, I know that, you know, it's an ongoing project and you can't really comment every single time. Um, but, um, um, uh, My train of thought just derailed. Go ahead, SB. I'm sorry. I can't think anymore. We'll get back. Yeah, no, maybe in terms of the um, your train of thought would be, yeah, the, the updates, because they're just starting to collect the data. So I think it'll be, you know, maybe checking back in with Brian and seeing, you know, what that's going to look like, like how often is the report out going to be after, you know, the grant ends. So, I mean, just to tag on to what you were saying, but as far as like for the uh, future EJAG meeting agenda items, um, the vehicle trade-in program, I have a request um, because we have several um, folks that were, I had made this comment in a couple of meetings prior that were waiting, right, for the vehicle trade-in program. Some of them have um, like left the program and they just got a vehicle on their own because they weren't able to um, to wait because I guess there's like a backlog. So um, if staff could assist us with giving us an update, I would greatly appreciate it. I don't know if there's other EJAG members that that's the issue because um, I can't really give um, our community members an answer to that. And um, and especially because it's, it's such a, a long, you know, it's just such a long backlog that, that's taking place. And so I hate to see, you know, folks like drop off of that program. Um, so if that's one of the things that folks agree that maybe we could have an update on the vehicle trading program. Thanks. I second that request. Yep. Okay, any other items? And obviously between now and our next meeting, if you think of another item that you would like to uh, have included in the June agenda, please reach out to Jessica and uh, you know we can include it in the agenda. Okay, so we are going to ask for the last opportunity for public comments, if there are any. Are there any public comments in Bakersfield? There are no public comments in Bakersfield. Thank you. Are there any public comments in Modesto? No public comments in Modesto. No members of the public present in Fresno and no indication of any online comments. Thank you. So any members of our EJAC group would like to make additional comments? Sorry, I, I missed it. I was in a side conversation about the Amazon truck, but um, a potential future EJAG meeting, I was thinking from my, my comment earlier with the reporter that I was talking about, um, I think it's been brought up in the past and maybe it was at one of the meetings that I missed, um, but uh, a, a future agenda item can be kind of a comprehensive overview of how the, the Air District plans on um, tackling the wildfire um, issue Kind of like like we were saying, you know, dealing with getting filters to people, but what what else, you know, might they be advocating for, working on with working for other departments? Because that was when I made that comment in 2016. That was part of the answer. I don't know which staff member was there that gave the answer, but it was, you know, we're we're looking for partnerships to make with other uh, agencies. Um, and so I've, you know, I was curious. Well, what's happened since then? Um, is that going on? Um, what does that look like? Maybe that can be a, a future EJAG of presentation. And I also, I'll just say, it's great to see such a big contingent that we have up here in the North Valley. I think we're used to seeing everybody down there in Fresno. And I think uh, congratulations to us for uh, taking over. <laughs> Go Modesto. <laughs> Any last comments? <laughs> Okay, I think they're having some um, individual conversations there, so we will be ready to just uh, uh, adjourn our meeting uh, being 723, and our next meeting is scheduled on June 22nd at 530. Thank you all. Have a good evening.